Tom here from Lawrence Systems and Synology sent me, but I do have to send it back, so full disclosure there, a SA3200D. This is a high availability in a passive active mode dual controller Synology. Now we use Synology for a lot of small businesses, mostly like the 918 series are really popular right now here in August of 2020. and. Uh, this is something a little bit higher end. Of course, comes a little bit higher end sticker, but it's got a lot of impressive features. And I think it's a really affordable HA system, so I was excited to review it, uh, you know, kind of evaluate it. Now, I don't have any of these in production deployment. It's a pretty new system. Matter of fact, I was on a waiting list to get this system here. Now, I actually have as well, and we're going to talk about this, one of the modules out. Well, this is the one that went bad. Uh, and these demo units are sent back and forth quite a bit and they do go through and thoroughly test them. But uh, this one died during my testing. So I thought that makes the review that much more interesting while I was uh, you know, pulling the power supply, well, pulling the plugs out of the power supplies. Uh, this one didn't come back on after I had did one of my resets. I thought that was, you know, a little bit interesting because it adds a little bit of intrigue of what happens when it crashes, how do you rebuild them, uh, because it comes basically configured, and I wanted to see how you rebuild. So we're going to cover that process, so to me that's just kind of bonus material, and I believe it probably has more to do with the fact that it's a demo unit that gets sent back out a lot. Um, they have not, I did, t I actually spent some time talking with the technicians actually just inquiring about these devices. Uh, no one and nowhere I could find do they have any high rates of failure. Um, and they do come with a five year warranty and the next day aired right away another module out there. And by the way, I was able to keep testing everything on a single module and everything worked perfectly fine. So even with the module out, um, no issues. Uh, pop the module in and away we went. It restored and I'll cover that process in a little bit. Before we jump into all those details, let's first. If you'd like to learn more about me or my company, head over to lawrencesystems.com. If you'd like to hire a short project, there's a hires button right at the top. If you'd like to help keep this channel sponsor free and thank you to everyone who already has, there is a join button here for YouTube and a Patreon page. Your support is greatly appreciated. If you're looking for deals or discounts on products and services we offer on this channel, check out the affiliate links down below. They're in the description of all of our videos, including a link to our shirt store. We have a wide variety of shirts that we sell and new designs come out, well, randomly, so check back frequently. And finally, our forums. Forums.lawrencesystems.com is where you can have a more in-depth discussion about this video and other tech topics you've seen on this channel. Now, back to our content. Now, I'm going to start here at the product page for it. SA3200D is the module, is the system you see right in front of me. And it does look exactly like, at least from the appearance, I don't have one of these, the UC3200. And it caused a little bit of confusion, but I figured, hey, I'll clarify this real quick. The UC3200 is an active, active IP SAN, and it only runs iSCSI, not the full Synology software. So this is a very specific, very reliable, high availability iSCSI services box. That's the UC3200. And this, the SA3200D, runs the Synology Disk Station software, but is also high availability, but it's in an active passive. Now, active active is for absolutely seamless failovers where you don't even notice. Active passive, there's a delay between the time the device fails and the time it recovers. So what we're gonna cover when I show how the failover works in this, I didn't have a problem with the failover, including running VMs on it, but of course they pause for the moments in time it takes for it to go from active to passive. It switches rather quick, but I'll at least mention that, that it's not an active active, and they do make an active active, but it doesn't run the full disk station. So a little bit of clarification right there. And also I don't have these, but it does support up to two RXD 1219 SAS expansion units. So when you see these in a stack, you can actually take the UC um, 3200 or the SA 3200 and add on those extra ones for more drive. So when you see somewhere wrong in the marketing where it says it can have even more support than the bays that are in front of this, well, that's what they're talking about there. So dual storage controllers, uh, shared storage design, each controller fully talks to all the storage. So that's not a problem in these devices. So even though it's active passive, it doesn't actually go through the entire boot up or uh, looking at the drives. One one module at a time can control the drives, but both modules are always in sync with the drives. So doing the failover, the VMs did not crash, which is actually really cool for that. Up to 36 drives, and this is why I said, you know, talked about supporting expansion modules on there, because, uh, well, you're not gonna fit 36 drives on the one in front of me. 
scales up with you, and then they show this. Then they show the modules in the back, and we'll cover those in a little bit more detail. But uh, there is the mini SAS port, like you see right here, and then we have the 10 gig port. So we have a 10 gig port here, a 10 gig port here, and two 1 gig ports. But there is technically only one 10 gig per module. So you can't team those together to be 20, in case you're wondering, because these modules have to be independent of each other. Processor is the Intel Xeon D1521 that does have four DDR4 slots, comes with eight gigs of RAM. That is how these were shipped to us as well. Modulized cooling, dual fan modules per controller. We'll cover that when I show them taken apart. It does use a SATA DOM. Now the SATA DOM is interesting because it's, it's storing the DSM on a SATA DOM, not on the drives on the system. And so that covers when you're setting it up, you don't have to worry about loading to the drives that are in here. You can configure it and it loads at least the DSM software to the SATA DOM and it's still redundant because it's on both controllers. And anything you do to one controller automatically happens on the other one. And of course you have all the great Synology. I've done a review on the active backup for business uh, software and talked about that. And that's once again, all the bells and whistles you get with the Synology disk station manager do come with this as well. So if you want to run that, not only can you run it on here, but you get to run it in a mode of active passive. And if there's ever a failure, it still can keep on going. So this does uh, you know, cover the high reliability on theirs. Um, what else do we have? The five-year warranty, Synology replacement services. And as I said, the module failed. And I have a feeling this really has to do with the fact that these are demo units and these get shipped quite a bit, reboxed. Now, this thing was an impeccably clean when I got it. The tiniest little thing I could find is a little bend here. But like I said, this is what gets sent out to reviewers. They send it back to Synology. They clean it up, format it, blank it, make sure it all works, send it back out to the next person to review. I have been on the waiting list. I believe this was mentioned to me in December of 2019, right around there. Um, and it took that long before they got one out to me, which was all the way here at, towards the end of July in 2020. So I know it's been through a lot of hands for demos. If you look around for reviews, you'll see other sites that reviewed these already. So that being said, after so many people reviewing it, taking it apart and looking at it, that seems to up the likelihood that something will happen. Uh, and it did. And this unit right here failed. Uh, no big deal. They overnighted me another one. And that process was really, really easy. And the fact is, I could see, keep continuing at least my testing, other than the failover testing part, uh, on a single module. It worked perfectly fine. And I got to go through the whole process there. And we'll cover that in the software part, uh, showing you what happens when it loses a module and can't detect it anymore. So. As far as the system goes itself, uh, we looked at all the specs and we looked at all the details. Let's actually take it apart a little bit. And I'm not going to bother about pulling the lid off this because the only thing you're exposing is the modules that come out. So I'm going to spin it around and show you how those modules come out. It's actually really simple. So we'll start here on the back. We have these little screw modules right here and they lever out. So we can do this and away we go. And then the units just slide out like this. Pretty straightforward. And they have a really nice feel, build quality. They go in real smooth and this lever part puts them back in. And then we just tighten them back up so no one can slide them out. Now the modules are not distinct to the ports. We do have it labeled, it's kind of written small there, but A and B, and you can switch these back and forth. It really doesn't matter when the system comes up. It makes no difference to them. So uh, there's not one labeled for one port or the other. Hot swap power supplies. We have these little power supplies in there and they are 500 watt modules, uh, they come out really easy. Once again, they're hot swap as well. Now, I did confirm with the Synology people, these are hot swappable, that they can be taken in and out of service while it's on, but they prefer you not do it unless you really, really have to. And I only say that because what happens is if you turn these on and off and slide them in and out quite a few times, uh, you end up potentially scarring the modules in there. And obviously, if a lot of people do that in the demos, and I'm positive a lot of people have, uh, you could end up messing up the ends on there. Now, it's something you can do. Um, and if you're dealing with this in a production environment, it's not something you're doing all the time. So it's only on a you know emergency as needed basis. So it's rare. But on the demo units, I imagine it's been done quite a few times. I don't know. And that, may, that may have led to the problems we had with the one module in this. Now to take a closer look at the modules themselves, these lids just snap on and off that are on there. So that part's toolless and the fans then they're quite well dual fans. So one on each side, independently spinning of each other edge connectors that go right into the base there and they firmly fit in really easy, have a little arrow on them. So, you know, you got the airflow, right? So these are easy to swap, slide a module out. If a fan were to go bad, well, we have two fans on each side and away we go. Airflow is nice and straight through the system. The modules on the end here, 
We have the SATA DOM over here, and then we have the edge connectors themselves. They are small, but I don't see any issues in the edge connectors of causing any type of problem. Uh, they didn't feel like I'm gonna bend them or anything like that. When I put it in, this fits so snugly in there and smoothly when it goes in that the build quality didn't make me worry that I was going to break it when I was inserting the module and lifting the lever up. So that made me really happy. Like overall, it feels really good. One minor complaint, but this is me. And what do you see on the back here? is that little nine pin serial. And the only reason I'm complaining about it is probably a dumb reason. The nine pin serial on here, I was hoping would provide me some diagnostic data to the module that wasn't working because it did power cycle on and off briefly. Uh, that's this one right here. And the nine pin does nothing. No, the nine pin doesn't do anything on this broken module, but the nine pin does work on the other ones for bringing you to a login prompt. So it is redirecting the output to those, but to me, a nine pin serial is odd, like an odd choice to put on there. Maybe it's just because I know there's still a lot of it out there, even in the enterprise market, but I do kind of prefer the standard USB so I can plug it directly in. But I've been in business for a while, so of course I have those nine pins laying around in a box and I was able to go get one out of the box that we don't access very often uh, for the occasion when we have to find something that requires the old style nine pin minor complaint but hey whatever i'll at least bring it up that, that yes that is actually a working serial port on the back well it doesn't have any functional use it's only for diagnostic use now let's talk about the drives themselves and spin it around so the drives here are really easy to slide out and once again really smooth so no complaints here as far as like the build quality on them and they have a little lock so you can't press the button and get them out so you just snap that over now they are not though toolless. So you do gotta put some screws in these, not a huge deal. I do like toolless because when you're setting up a whole lot of drives, it's quick and easy, but they give you all the screws you need to put it in there. Now this does have holes for three and a half and two and a half inch drives. So no big deal putting them in. Build quality wise though, I would say these are really solid. When you slide a drive out, you're not feeling like it'll, there's very little play. And once you get them in there, no play at all. This is really lined up well. So it inserts, no problem lock drives in there works perfectly fine all right so now let's get to the software part because that's where the fun begins actually seeing how the failover works seeing if the vms work which spoiler uh, if you don't want to go any further yes they work it fails over perfectly fine yes it does pause and we'll cover those details in a second of how the active passive work in here so let's get started with that so when the system starts up, it's a little bit noisy as it goes through the fan test, hits about 97 and calms down in about the 80s for normal runtime. Obviously that's gonna vary with load and heat and how your server room is set up. So obviously not quiet enough that you want it on the desk next to you, but not unreasonably loud either. All right, and we have the Synology all set up, configured. We've already loaded the DSM software. I kind of skipped that part, but it's not anything different than the other Synologies that we've set up. Uh, so you run through, it comes blank, it downloads the latest version of the Distation Manager. But one extra step they add in there is this Synology High Availability plugin. Now, this one of the questions it's gonna ask you on setup is what is the IP address for high availability? You have to pick a static IP address. We chose 192.168.3.215. So choosing that address, and now let's go over to how it's actually plugged in with the two 10 gig ports on this Unify switch, we have these device names, HA19AO and HA20150 and the respective IP addresses of 192.168.3.215 and the other one is 3.163. Now the active controller always gets the static address. The passive controller, is set to DHCP and it just grabs an address from my network. So when we switch these controllers, because it's not flipping the MAC addresses, it's only flipping the IP address assignments. Now there's a couple ways this can happen. One, we can do switchover and we'll do that real quick here. You're about to perform a switchover to the passive server and all tasks will be canceled and running. So I would like to proceed with the action and cancel all running tasks. So if you have some active thing you're doing, like a running task, it may cancel that. But this is the controlled version where we said initiate the switchover. Now the two devices stay in sync with each other by a transparent backplane essentially that is between the active and passive controller. So they don't need any of the network interfaces to be plugged in for the two devices to talk to each other. That's how they stay in sync. So anytime you load a feature or set something up inside of the active controller, the passive controller always immediately gets those settings. Like I said, even if the network 
uh, is not talking because the back planes talk to each other and they're both talking to the drives at the same time. Now this switches over relatively fast. This is like the controlled one takes about 16, 17 seconds for it to do the switch over. Now this part takes a little bit longer, probably about 20 seconds before this, but if you were to ping it and see when the availability of the device is, it's about 14 seconds. Now the failover itself, like a catastrophic failover or just unplugging the network cable, that takes pretty consistently between 49 and 50 seconds I timed when doing those. So if we were to just go unplug the system, it does take a little bit longer because it's looking for the network uh, back and forth to be able to find it. And the same thing when the controller failed, it paused a little bit longer while that controller was failed and then it switches back over. Now, the way we have this configured is as a storage device for my Zen server. So a little bit expanded view of the lab, we have XCPNG running on the Super Micro Super Storage server uh, that I had reviewed previously. I can leave a link to that particular review if you're interested in the server. But the Synology NFS share and Synology iSCSI. So I have the Synology as, and this is a pretty popular use case for this high availability system, set up as a storage target for virtual machines. It'll also work with VMware. It also works with Citrix. I just happen to like XCPNG, so I'm running that on here. And I have one share set up as NFS and one share as iSCSI. And when you go here to the high availability, you can actually choose high availability to be applied to the iSCSI target and the NFS target. And you choose which network interfaces you want the high availability to be talking on and connect to. And for me, that's LAN 3 which is the 10 gig port on these. So it's each, as I stated and want to show in the hardware, each one of these has the 10 gig port. Now it does work uh, for SMB. We're not going to test the SMB. I did test the share. It does work. It does the same thing. It pauses if there's a failure of the network interface or while you're waiting up to 50 seconds for the failover. What I found more interesting was when it fails over as iSCSI and NFS as a target, it also, um, is able to keep the VMs up and running. So there's not any data loss, even though there's a connection loss, uh, Zen ho handles that quite well. And I don't have an ESXi system handy, but my understanding is it will handle it as well, where even though it loses hard drive connectivity, essentially it's storage controller temporarily, it will pause the reads and writes for the VMs. It'll queue those up and then drop them on the machine once it gets connectivity restored. One more comment before we do the demo real quick here is I also tested this. I took the Debian and ran the open benchmarking, which is the Pharonix tool. And I wanted to see if there was any significant difference between iSCSI and NFS running on the Synology system. And I didn't find any significant difference between them. They were pretty neck and neck. And I know maybe someone will point out that if you use certain block sizes or do more extensive testing, there might be some differences, but I didn't want to spend too much time on that because it goes out of scope of this particular review. But if there's some other, if I have time with this device and there's some other testing uh, that maybe some comments or suggestions are on, hey, I'll run those tests as well. But uh, at least for the brief here, you can see there's slight differences where NFS was faster on a couple instances uh, than iSCSI was a little bit better here, but like I said, these are not like night and day numbers. All right, I'll just drop that right here and move on to this. One little last note before we do the other failover test is please note that the IP addresses flip-flop on these as well. So when these two devices, and it statically assigns this one, because it's not changing the MAC address on here, it gets a different IP address for the uh, passive controller. So that's something of note of how that works on there for the active passive. All right, moving over to actually watching it fail over while it's doing something. Let's make sure we got our VMs fired up here. I have the Windows 10, and we'll kick it off to do something like a Windows update. Check for updates. So it's doing something and then we'll go over here to Debian, which is running, this is running on Synology iSCSI. So we'll log into this real quick. I think I have some task I can get it to do. Oh, cool, let's kick off a benchmark. So let's run all the tests. One. All right, so this is doing some disk activity, so it's read, write, and um, we'll see some IOPS on here. Let's see. It'll take a second while it queues it up and we'll see some disk action there. We'll go over here to the Synology system and open up the resource monitor. We should see some load on here, so we can see it's 
got some disk activity. There we go. So we got some network, not huge amount of activity, but uh, disk utilization, reads and writes, iSCSI is uh, going to ramp up here a little bit. So 8.5 as it rums up these tests, we should get some more, you know, activity on there, but, you know, it shows that the drives are in use. Okay, I've actually waited a little bit so it had more disk activity, but now we want to unplug it. And instead of going over and in the other room and do it, we're just going to disable it in the Unify controller and turn off that port. So right now we're on controller B and we're going to force it to fail over to controller A. So we look over here, look at the ports and port three is plugged into controller B. So we'll go ahead and edit this port and we will switch it to disabled, apply and all right, it's provisioning changes sent. All right, it's disconnected. So now, we actually try to reload the page, it's gonna to fail to reload this page because there's a moment. And this is the part that takes about 50 seconds to do. It's slowly switching over. And right now, let's see what our Debian system, it should see a drop as well. So if we go over here, actually we'll go to the storage controller and look at the Synology NFS. The stats will end up going flat. Storage, uh, Synology iSCSI. It can't talk to it, so all the stats go flat, actually, for even the history for a moment while it tries to figure out what's going on. And reload the page one more time. And now we're switched over to the other side. Warning, abnormal network. And what it did was realize this is abnormal. It realized this one's connected, so it automatically failed it over and highlights in orange that this isn't working. The whole thing happens relatively fast. If we go back over here and we look at the VMs running on this. So we look at the disk usage, still flat because it lost connectivity. So it's pausing and catching up on everything there. But if you look at this system itself, it's still up and running. So we didn't lose connectivity. We don't have it uh, dying. It's still able to do a uh, task. The VMs didn't crash out. Uh, look at the Debian system. It's still running the tests. Actually go over here to console. The tests probably are all over the place. Deviation of 51%. The deviation in the testing is basically going, well, we lost connectivity for a little while, so we have this wide variant of we were getting results, and then all of a sudden we got no results. For an active passive system, I'm going to say this is pretty reasonable um, on how fast this works. Now, as far as restoring things back to normal, as you know right now, we can't click the switch over, but we can go here, go back in here, and we'll just turn the port back on, hit apply. It'll provision this change right back over there. And as soon as it does, this will come right back up and running. Once it realizes that the port's back, plugged back in, the anomaly goes away, it clears, and the faults are gone. Now, a couple other final details on this. Uh, I've done this quite a few times. I've done the switch over manually through this. I've done it uh, obviously just by unplugging it many times. I've done it by pulling the power out, out of here multiple times. And we went through the failure of the module itself, which in none of these instances that I ever lose my lab systems that are running on this. And now the system's back to being healthy because it realizes it's plugged back in. So that part went really well. The other thing that went well was I haven't had any corruption from the system running ButterFS. They're, ButterFS implementation that they have here on Synology seems to be quite stable, quite solid, and didn't run into any issues setting up in the storage manager on this. And all the random unplugging of the system trying to get it to fail did not cause any catastrophes or issues. And to give you an idea, if I probably go through here the logs, you can see there's been quite a few times over the last few days that I've just keep randomly unplugging it. Recover from abnormal, recover from abnormal. So. I did not have any times where I felt as though the system was going to have any problems at all because every time it recovered, which made me really happy. Um, you know, I was, I like to put them through their paces because when someone buys something that says high availability, they're probably putting it in somewhere that they need really good, reliable service. And because I didn't have any of these in production, I just been unplugging it a lot over the last couple of days to get uh, some baseline of it. Plus all the VMs I've been running, I had them just looping, running all kinds of demos to really put the rights on this to make sure it would hold up to it over time. And so far, no issues at all. Granted, I've only been testing it for a few days. We started testing on, looks like uh, the 29th is when I started the testing on it. And 
no issues. Now, the module that failed, one side note, I thought when they shipped me the new module, just by putting it in, it would automatically detect it and set it up. It didn't. All I had to do, though, was go to the IP address of it. It says, would you like to set up the disk, disk station manager on this? You said yes. It says downloading the software. Once it downloaded, it started talking to the other controller and got all of its settings. So there's nothing I had to do inside the main UI itself. I just had to say yes to downloading the software and then it configured itself. Now, the last thing I'm going to cover on this is price. How much does this thing cost? I, I, a lot of people like to ask that. And uh, sometimes I skip that part because I don't know just how relevant it is because prices are what they are right now and not necessarily what they will be when you are watching this video. But to at least look at a couple places, because there's more than one place that sells it, uh, if we look at all, see all buying Amazon options, looks like it's around between 7,800, 8,200, 8,300. We'll look at somewhere like CDW, they're looking at 8,206 uh, as the advertised price and seven thousand dollars over here at adorama so a couple different places um, that you can look for and find these so it kind of depends on where you buy them and why i often skip price unless i know where you can buy it directly from the seller who has a price listed on their site and synology does not offer direct sales but does have a long list of places where you can buy their products we're not an official reseller of synology um, we are just someone who likes using their products and maybe one day we'll be a reseller but for the most part we are not on this list in case you're wondering uh, we do configuration setup of these but we are not an official reseller of these devices so you can purchase them wherever you like and uh, take for that what you will all right well that's it for my synology review i do like the device as i stated in the beginning of the video i don't have any of these actively deployed out in the market uh, but my testing with all the other synology devices we found them very reliable uh, this is a nice lineup in their ha and for that price tag when you get into ha systems this is pretty reasonable because ha is pretty expensive uh, on some of the other systems we've talked about uh, once you get to the really high-end ones, you could be talking somewhere around twenty plus thousand dollars or some sticker prices. The fact that they get this granted with no hard drives below that uh, mark is pretty good for an HA system, even though it's still active, passive, active, active generally costs a little bit more. Uh, maybe at some point I will take a look at and review their other active, active system. But I think this is good because it has the full disk station manager on there and it does active, pa active, passive failover and allow you to run all the great utilities that come with the disk station manager, especially like this active backup for business, which I have done a review on. All right. And thanks. And thank you for making it to the end of the video. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. If you'd like to see more content from the channel, hit the subscribe button and hit the bell icon if you like YouTube to notify you when new videos come out. If you'd like to hire us, head over to lawrencesystems.com, fill out our contact page, and let us know what we can help you with and what projects you'd like us to work together on. If you want to carry on the discussion, head over to forums.lawrencesystems.com where we can carry on the discussion about this video, other videos, or other tech topics in general, even suggestions for new videos. They're accepted right there on our forums, which are free. Also, if you'd like to help the channel out in other ways, head over to our affiliate page. We have a lot of great tech offers for you. And once again, thanks for watching and see you next time.